Hey Bible lovers, I'm Tim Nichols, and today I'm here to bring you a different type of Nicholsworth. We're going to be answering the question, are there verses missing in my Bible? Now, this has been a hotly debated issue, especially since the NIV came out in 1984. That was really the first translation based off the critical apparatus that really took off and really became very popular. In fact, even today, it's the number one selling translation. And there's a lot of controversy over it because the NIV decided to go with the critical apparatus, also known as the CT, the critical text, from the Nestle and Allen textual source. And people began to notice there were some differences. And there were some verses that were quote unquote missing in the NIV that were in the King James. There were all sorts of controversies going around, all sorts of accusations going around saying the NIV was not inspired. They jokingly called it the nearly inspired version. But one thing I think is important to know is that NIV was not the first translation to actually use what is called textual criticism, which we'll dive into in a moment. But the first one, to my knowledge, was actually the ASV. And the ASV uses the critical apparatus or the father to the critical apparatus known as the Westcott and Hort. And this one actually has those same verses, quote unquote, missing. But the one that really sounded off the alarms was the RSV. And the reason we didn't really hear about it a lot until the NIV is because the RSV never quite took off as a Protestant translation. In fact, it's pretty difficult to even find the RSV in print anymore. The only options that you have currently is the Quintel by Schuyler. And then you have some RSV CE Catholic editions that are in print. And then coming up here in a couple of months, we're going to have the RSV Sovereign from Thomas Nelson. But other than that, it's a pretty hard translation to find. It's not a super popular translation, but the NIV is a different animal because it's popular. A lot of churches use it. So let's talk about the issues with are there verses missing in my Bible? The first thing we have to consider is the textual source. Is the textual source the Textus Receptus, or is the textual source the critical apparatus? The critical apparatus goes back and uses some older manuscripts. The Textus Receptus was compiled sometime in the 1500s. It was based on manuscripts that the church at that time believed were preserved and were the originals. So if there are differences between the critical apparatus and the Textus Receptus, I think we can all agree both cannot be the original. The question is, can both be inspired? With that in mind, perhaps the critical text is missing some verses. Perhaps the Textus Receptus added some verses for clarity that were meant to be in the marginal notes that made their way into the text. Ultimately, I don't know. That's outside my wheelhouse. A couple of YouTube channels that I really encourage you to look at is Dwayne Green and Mark Ward. They both do a beautiful job talking about the differences between the two texts and whether or not they are inspired, I really highly recommend those two YouTube channels for that purpose. Another thing to keep in mind is that all the quote unquote missing verses are actually footnoted in your Bibles that use the critical apparatus. They are not missing, they are there, they are just not in the main body of the text. There are a few examples where they're in the main body of the text. For example, the ending of Mark, and then you have the woman caught in adultery, which we'll talk about in a minute. And there's a few larger chunks like that to where they just bracket them to let you know, hey, these are disputed. But ultimately, none of them are missing. They are all in the footnotes. So to say that the NIV is missing verses, it's simply not true. You just have to look at those textual footnotes. There are some significant verses that we do need to take a look at that are either disputed or that are put in the footnotes of our NIV or any modern text that's based off the critical apparatus. The only modern text today that is not based off the critical apparatus would be the New King James. And I'll talk about that in just a second as well. But 1 John 5, 7, also known as the Jonahine comma, seems to give credence to the Trinity, where it says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And that section where it says there are three that bear record in heaven is not found in any of the ancient manuscripts. It does not show up really until the Textus Receptus. So that one has been hotly disputed as to whether or not it is inspired. Another example is found in John 5 verses 3 and 4 where the lame man is trying to get in the pool of Bethesda and it says an angel stirs the waters in order for people to be healed. And we don't know if that's original or not. We don't know if that was footnoted or not. It is in the Textus Receptus, so it's gonna be in your King James, but in your critical text, that's going to be moved to the footnotes. And I'll be honest, that verse is probably one of the weirdest ones to me, and probably one of the more difficult to defend. The angel stirring the water, it seems a little mystical to me. However, it's not an impossible scenario for God to involve angels in his plan to heal and deliver and to help men. So your guess is as good as mine there. Another big example is the woman caught in adultery that's at the end 
end of John chapter 7 and moving on into John chapter 8 till about verse 11. That whole, he who is without sin cast the first stone. There's a lot of arguments on this woman caught in adultery section as to whether or not it's written in John's style of writing and whether or not possibly it belongs somewhere else or whether or not it was possibly an oral record that was just added to the Gospels because they believe it actually happened. Personally, I believe it's a real inspired event. The woman caught in adultery actually happened and he who is without sin cast the first stone is something Jesus actually said. However, it's not in some of your older manuscripts. So depending on which textual source your Bible is on is going to be how they're going to handle this. Most of your modern translations are going to have that one bracketed and let you know in the notes, hey, this is a disputed text. And of course, the biggest one is the ending of Mark. Does it end and they were afraid or does it continue on to include the account of the resurrection of Jesus? Does it talk about believers speaking in tongues? Does it talk about taking up serpents? Does it talk about drinking poison and you will not be harmed? This one I believe has the strongest evidence of inclusion in the main text and that is why I believe some of your critical texts add that in there and just let you know it's disputed. Kind of like the woman caught in adultery. They have strong evidence of support in quotations by the early church fathers. And it seems even some of the manuscripts that are missing that, there's a space where maybe it could have faded out or where it used to be. I'm not an expert in this field, so I don't fully know, but I do believe that all of Mark 16 is absolutely inspired. Also, another thing that you have to keep in mind is many of the quote-unquote missing verses are actually quoted elsewhere in the Scripture. For example, Matthew 18, 11, where the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost, is actually quoted again in the Gospel of Luke in verses 19, 10, so we know that that is preserved and inspired, so there's no problem with keeping that in Matthew. Another thing to consider is any of the missing verses that actually can't be verified in other places in the scripture or really seem to potentially have been footnotes or something that were accidentally added to the text of the TR, none of those affect any major doctrine, whether they're added or subtracted. In fact, many claim that the NIV and some of the modern translations take away from the deity of Jesus, but I would actually say that's not correct because in other places where the deity of Jesus is mentioned, it's even more strongly translated and more obvious to me that Jesus is God. There's no denying that Jesus is God no matter what textual source that you use. There's no denying the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all divine and part of one Godhead, no matter what translation you read. So I really think that that's just misguided and a lot of people just being unreasonable because it's not their translation of choice from their textual source of choice. One of the biggest arguments regarding this position is 1 Timothy 3.16, where the King James and the New King James says that God was manifested in the flesh, while other more modern translations from the critical apparatus say he was manifested in the flesh speaking of Jesus and they're saying that that is taking away from the deity of Christ but I disagree no matter if it said originally God was manifested in the flesh or he was manifested in the flesh either way for Jesus to take on flesh and to be manifested in the flesh is a strong testament to his deity because men humans don't need to be manifested in the flesh we're born in the flesh also we have John chapter 1 that says the word became flesh so Jesus being the word being manifested in the flesh being God I think that all means the same thing and nothing is really hindered there so at the end of the day which textual source is actually inspired I'm probably gonna make people on both sides mad because I believe they are both inspired I believe they are both God's holy word. And I think when you use them both comparatively and fairly, what you actually have is astonishing evidence that God preserved his word. Because previously, the oldest manuscripts we had of the Old Testament were somewhere around 900 to 1000 AD. And then the oldest manuscripts that we had of the New Testament were somewhere around the 14 to 1500 AD. Now we have textual sources and fragments dating all the way back to within 50 years of the original New Testament. And we have entire manuscripts dating within the 300s and the 400s, which is 250 years of the original documents. And there's incredible agreement. The variants or the quote unquote missing verses that we see can either be compiled somewhere else. No doctrine majorly is affected. And even let's just say that the story of the woman caught in adultery is actually not inspired and it was simply added. Even if we were to concede that there are so many places in the Bible where Jesus forgives and he's known as forgiving and loving, we really don't lose a whole lot. I know that may be a controversial take. And again, I happen to believe that the woman caught in adultery is inspired. It is original. And maybe it was added to the Gospel of John just for the purpose of putting it in there. Maybe it was an oral report passed down that somebody said, hey, we need to preserve this before it gets lost. I don't know. But the fact is there are no missing verses in your Bible. They are in the footnotes. Now, here's where I land on it. I actually prefer the Textus Receptus. I want all of what I believe to be the inspired verses in the body of my text, 
not in the footnotes. One thing about modern day scholarship that really does bug me a little bit, when you read the footnotes and it says the oldest and best manuscripts say, and I believe that that can sometimes cast doubt as to whether or not the Textus Receptus is actually a good, solid manuscript. I believe the Textus Receptus is the Word of God. I believe it is the Word of God preserved throughout history. However, I also believe that the critical text or the older manuscripts are the Word of God and that many of the differences and variants can be easily explained by using the methods I just talked to you about. But the fact that we have what I would consider overwhelming agreement doctrinally and verse by verse agreement, I think what we really have is an amazing thing. Now translation philosophy and all that, I'll post a video of my thoughts on that on the end screen because I do believe that translation philosophy is the larger problem, not textual source. God bless you. Keep calm. Jesus on. This is your Nicholsworth.